Actor Brian Cranston and talk show host Bill Maher clashed on Maher's Club Random podcast when the two men got into critical race theory in schools. Let's take a listen. Critical race theory can mean it's, I mean, it's just one of these catch-all terms. If you mean we should honestly teach our past, of course. If you mean more what the uh, 1619 book says, which is that it's just the essence of America and that we are irredeemable, that's just wrong. It's yeah. not... I mean, okay. yeah, right. I, I, I agree with that. But even even teaching our past and being honest and owning up to who we are as a country in the history. Of it. Most schools are doing that. I mean, I'm sure there are ones in Texas that are not. Look, in Florida, they're, they're, they they want to do do away with critical race theory in a lot of other states. Because, some, because sometimes it veers off into things that are really not appropriate in schools. So how do you govern you, that? If you're how telling you... five-year-olds that you're either an oppressor or someone who uh, was uh, oppressed, you're, you're introducing ideas about race that are inappropriate for, for kids that age who can't understand okay. it. Okay, and we have to find that time that level of maturity when a, when a child can understand that at certain times in this country's history, there was a grave mistreatment of other human beings. I think we get that. Well, no, we don't get it. What oh, do we get Really? It? You think that is not something that is now widely understood and agreed? Yeah, it's definitely not widely understood. That America has a, a sorry racist past? It's talked about and whispered, but they don't whispered. know. Whispered? Yes. It's, you, it, what, what, the Jim Crow laws? So, but that's so Emancipation years ago. Proclamation I, I in 1865, it was 1965 or in 1964 when the Civil Rights Act was passed by LBJ. But, but this is 2023. It took a hundred years. I know, but is my point. Can we live in the year we're living in? You don't think we should live in the year living okay, in. Okay, well, the year we're living in is not. Drive is, me to drink. It's not, you, it's not what man. you're describing. Hmm, that was Bill Maher, Brian Cranston arguing about CRT. Two white guys arguing about CRT. Are you <laughs> thrilled about this debate happening? Yeah, I think that Brian Cranston. I thought both made, made a lot of good points, but. Good points. I mean, talking about the year we're living in when both men involved in the conversation, along with. My mother were born in a country where my mother did not have civil rights under the law. My, my mother is 62. My mother's not old. And so two men sitting there, one of whom saying, like, this is the distant past, when he got to be born into a country where he had civil rights under the law, mm -hmm. my mother was not, my father was not, my father graduated from the first integrated class of his high school in Virginia in the late 70s, he was the youngest of seven. All of his class, all of his siblings went to segregated schools. All of my aunts and uncles went to segregated schools. It just, I don't know, like it, it Bill Maher said it, said it was 100 years ago. I promise you none of my aunts and uncles are 100 years old, you know? Uh, he brought up an interesting point with the critical race theory discussion is that it is it has become a catch-all term for a whole lot of different things. Uh, which I think makes it difficult and probably not wise to take the approach of like banning critical race theory because what does that even mean? And actually, I saw Jordan Peterson on, I think it was on Joe Rogan's podcast actually recently, saying that he didn't agree with what they were doing in Florida mm -hmm. with respect to critical race theory because he said when even trying to define it is very difficult and it, it's we kind of know what we're talking about, but. The, the way activists who are very upset about critical race theory, what they're referring to doesn't exactly match what people who are proponents of it or who, or who say they educate with a critical race theory lens. It's kind of different. It's related. It's very confusing, which is why, like, banning that ends up. And, and then it, you might be meaning it could come across that you're, like, banning that, like, the legal theory, which is mostly discussed in law, which right. you don't want to do. If what you are trying to get rid of is is that uh, I think most people agree that you know you should not you should not instruct people of one race that they that they can't they're going to struggle or not accomplish things because they're different or treat them differently, which is called for in in some of the very activisty um, inst instructing materials, the the aspects of white supremacy document, those kinds of things. I think that is what people who are 
upset with critical race theory are actually trying to keep out of schools. And I think it is fine to keep those things out of schools because they're kooky and don't really have much academic basis anyway. Yeah, I think there are some HR, diversity and inclusion materials that are that overstep. It's really DEI, not it's, CRT. It's, it's DEI. Yeah. And it's a lot of people who are not professional, uh, are not particularly professional, I got to say, not really, that are kind of dreaming stuff up out of the blue for in the HR context that aren't, it's not a very academic or rigorous right. area. And they are stealing concepts from an academic context and injecting them into context where I agree they don't belong. I also think that there is legitimately a, a, something, a phenomenon kind of described as Afro-pessimism that exists in the legitimate CRT realm, where CRT progenitors like Derek Bell do talk very pessimistically about the possibility of reform uh, coming out of America's racist past, who think, who, who describe America as kind of um, inextricably racist. And there have been some contemporary commentators like um, Tanisi Coates who have picked up on some of that theme. And I think that at times, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones also writes in that way. Um, you know, what it, Todd Hesekos described it in that viral article as like a, a, the original sin, right? Mm -hmm. The blood fruit, something like that. Uh, racism is like the blood fruit, original sin of America. I personally, from a political perspective, never like that approach. I think it is doomerist. I think that it doesn't, it prevents people from aspiring to make changes that are absolutely necessary. I think it can minimize the changes that have occurred, which are meaningful, even if they are insufficient. And so I would agree that any language that is kind of Afro-pessimist, um, any language that would shift what is right and good, which is to say, there, people can benefic be beneficiaries of a racist system, even if they are not, in fact, racist. That, is, I think, is a little legitimate statement. Just like rich people benefit from being rich, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. But saying, like, you are a racist because you're a white kid, obviously, I don't think that that's right. Or the, the right. doomerism of, of expecting or uh, failure from kids of color because they are, are part of that ethnicity, which comes across in some of these materials where it's like, oh, you, you, hard work is an aspect of white people culture. So the fact that you're not hardworking is not your fault, which is also which is just a very racist thing to say in the first place, because I don't think hard work is, I think it'd be racist yes, to I, think that I that think it's, achievement it's, is only I something think, that belongs to white people. Yeah, I think that a lot of those characterizations are weird and wrong. I think there can be other conversations outside of our racial context about what kind of traits we value in a, in a kind of academic context. I mean, look at the huge differences between what we value here and what they what is valued in places like China. Mm -hmm. I think some of what how they do things is great and superior. We should learn some of the ways that we do things are greater superior and they should learn. I mean, there's all kind of different academic approaches about do we emphasize timeliness, order versus creativity, creative thinking, mm -hmm. challenging authority. All of that can be unpacked, but I do think that applying a racial lens to some of those things like um, hard work, diligence, timeliness is inappropriate. But fundamentally, what is going on here with the CRT? I mean, teachers are filming their classrooms in Florida, and the books are all gone. Entire school libraries are gone. I have a, a guy, a teacher, who's a math teacher in Florida who regularly calls into one of my into my call-in show, and he told me that they lost something like 40-odd books, math books, that they can no longer teach from. And I said, well, why? What's in the books? He says, hell if I know. And so whatever... This is similar to the trans discussion we're having. I think that there are legitimate concerns that are mixed mm -hmm. in here. But the way that these laws are being applied and rolled out, many people see parallels between other kind of authoritarian actions that have happened historically. Right. So we, and if we start here, where does it end? So the books on the shelves in the classrooms, my understanding is no one is telling them you have to take down those books. What they are, they're doing it out of, out of concern. I mean, the state, the, the government isn't. The schools are saying we don't know. We'd have to go through all these books to see what's exactly in them to, to see avoid, if they're violating of this law. So because of the potential liability, we're not going to do and, that. And that liability, to be clear, this is a Washington Post article explained this yesterday, the title of which is Hide Your Books to Avoid Felony Charges. Florida School is Still a Teacher. So that's they literally criminalizing teachers if they make a mistake and don't self-censor their I mean, the own schools book are, is incredibly authoritarian. Okay, the schools are, I think the schools are overreacting to this. So you're supposed to tell a teacher, uh, take a gamble. You might be thrown in jail. <laughs> you 
might, you might. I mean, face. I think they're saying exactly that to teachers, which is why. Right, they're, right. So they're it's not, it's not, a, it's not like, oh, you get to make a choice. It's, it's. There is no choice at a certain point when the penalties are so severe. And it, you know, if that's the America you want to live in, that's the America when you live in. But I thought that the whole point of this country was that we didn't do 1984. Look, the state of Florida's thinking is they don't like some of the books that got put in the the public school library, so they've set new rules for what those ought to be. And because they can't go through or determine what people were putting in their own classroom libraries, they don't get to have them. That's the well, look, if, trade-off if, they've if, made. If parents wanted, if they wanted to empower parents to do a survey, if the state wanted to do a survey or come up with a specific look, list of names, then I think that they that that's one way that they could go about it. Instead, they put the onus on teachers and said, we could jeopardize your teaching certificate, your ability to earn an income, to do the thing that you've trained so hard to do and that you care passionately about, your relationship with all of these kids. All of that is at jeopardy because we're too lazy to actually figure out what we're actually mad at. And we're just gonna say, uh, if someone comes up with something and you haven't taken it off your shelves, all of these criminal pen penalties, a felony, it's a felony. Mm -hmm. Penalty penalties can come down on your head. I, it doesn't get more draconian than that. I mean, they're, they're mad about inappropriate books in the school library. They want parents to have more say and input and not have a situation where teachers are bringing in potentially problematic well, books. Well, they're not, they haven't, they haven't nearly, nearly tailored a, a law or policy to do that. What yeah, they said. In fact, I don't think there is a way to narrowly tailor a law and policy to do that, which is why I favor school choice and just letting parents choose the right school for them. And the school can have whatever policies it wants. And if you don't like the policies of that school, you would go to a different school. I think that would be the best solution rather than having one centralized control to approached by either Republicans and Democrats to mandate everyone be educated under the exact same standards and books and policies when we're a country that doesn't really agree and different people want different things. I think that should be fine, yeah. but well, when I was, we're fighting when it I out at the level of state and, policy. And in school, and I was being taught right, very conservative politics in the context of my education, my parents were aware of it, and they trusted their parenting skills, frankly, to teach me the way that they wanted me to be taught. And they didn't rely on my personal education happening solely in the educational context. And they understood that you're gonna be exposed to things in your life, your kids are gonna be exposed to things that you don't agree with, and obviously there are limits or some things that are so extreme that I completely understand what, why a parent would want to intervene and maybe change schools. But I also think that there has to be some personal responsibility here from parents it, getting engaged with what their kids are reading, talking about it, reading their own selection of books to their kids at home if they don't like what's happening in school. Because certainly when I was taught that there was nothing wrong with the Confederate flag and that slavery was just a blip and all of these things that I learned in my school, I didn't internalize those lessons because I had parents at home that were very involved in my education. So it's a, mix, it's a mixed bag here. And I think at some, at some level, you can't be trying to structure at, at, on, on a policy basis in the public school system level, the intricacies of the specific lessons, parenting lessons that you want to instill in your kids well, it sounds like your school was getting over its skis as well. I, I don't. If parents don't want political indoctrination in their schools, or shouldn't want it right or left, or should at least have a choice in what kind of environment you get. Every it's so subjective, though. Everyone's going to think that something is indoctrination, and I, I don't mean to like. Yeah. you know, blur the lines here. Obviously, there are some things that we could kind of objectively, as a community, say are wrong, but like, if you can't come up with a list. If you can't even identify books that you actually think are the problem. Well, they did come up with a list. No, they didn't. Instead of actually having any kind of comprehensive list, they said, if you don't get, if you, you have to get rid of everything, lest I find something that I have a problem with later. Well, this, the, again, the government didn't tell the teachers that they have to get rid of everything in their own classrooms. That's how the schools have no, interpreted it. No, they just said, if you don't, on, you might have to go to jail or you might, whatever the, the felony penalties are, I'm not sure exactly yeah, what they like are. It's like guidance from the... Uh, from the federal, federal government. Oh my gosh. We'll have more rising right after this.